Back from the bye, we are inside black and gold. Steve Geller along with Jeff Nowak kicking into gear the last stretch of seven games for the Saints, and it'll be week 12 in Atlanta. In coming Atlanta. Back, coming back from the break, uh, the most hated of hatred rivals in the NFC South, the Dirty Birds. It's always great to strum up uh, Saints fans uh, with any kind of fun little Falcons tidbits to knock them off their pedestal. But this matchup, I think we kind of expected them to be right there with this Saints squad and for these final two games to mean something. And it, it the NFL is in, uh, did a good job here, I think, obviously, because um, it looks like we could be on a collision course to the end of the season where this game does mean something. So hopefully the Saints end up taking the first one from them obviously right off the bat. Yeah. Well, I will say like, I I'm, I'm disappointed in Bobby because he's had all season to come up with something better than the NFC Douth, which isn't a word. And he hasn't done it. I keep waiting. I keep waiting. And like NFC soft is right there. And he, he can't, he keeps coming. <laughs> NFC Douth. I'm like, that's not a word. But anyway, but that's, I always thought he was going for doubt. And it just he, comes out. I doubt. think he is, but like that's not how that like NFC least works because it's the East, and you add a letter to it, and it's a word. Douth is not a word; it means nothing. <laughs> but that, NFC Douth's South, not like that. Yeah, you can go with NFC South, and you can still say Sow, and then I think I just want you to pitch that to him. Uh, next time, next time you're on air and see what he says, because I think that's better. I think you should start going with that, because that's what it is. This is just soft, soft as baby poop division, right? This that is all this is. What, what do you mean five and five? We're not superpowers atop the, the the South and looking down at the the four and six peons. If all we were talking about was the <laughs> NFL South, then yes, you could say that. But unfortunately, there are several other divisions. <laughs> um, most of which are far more competitive, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so this is where we're at. And yeah, we did, we took a couple days off there for, for the bye week I felt like my mental health needed a couple days away. I wasn't tweeting. I wasn't really doing anything related to Saints football. And I think it helped. Like I feel made better about myself right now. You know, I went and saw a Marvel movie by myself at one in the afternoon on a Friday that, uh, good decision movie kind of was lame but it was a good decision either way um but yeah so that's kind of what we're going to be getting into is kind of it's kind of a reset right it was a reset for the saints it's going to be kind of a reset for us we're going to in this first segment break down the latest injury news with mike thomas marshawn Lattimore, Derek carr had a couple signings this week we'll get into that the second segment i want to kind of talk about so what are the, some of the keys that this saints team has to hit you know what are the notes they have to hit to make sure the final seven games is not a rerun of the first 10 games. And I think that there are some pretty obvious things they can improve on to make, make that, make that look better, make things look more secure and, and win some games convincingly, right. And beat bad teams, right. If all you are is a team that beats bad teams, you are a playoff team, right. And, and this season was always going to be make the playoffs and see what happens. And I think, that you're you're still in position to do that. So we're going to talk about that. And then the final segment, I do want to talk about, okay, what is kind of the history of five and five teams and, and, and going into the playoffs, making deep playoff runs, stuff like that. Also kind of resetting the deck about what's left on the schedule and what our expectations should be as they go into this run of just bad teams, right? Like this, the final seven games, got a lot of bad teams on that, on that list. Um, you know, I don't argue more bad teams on the back end than they had on the front end which people talk about how easy the schedule was. I think it ended up being a little bit more difficult in stretches than you probably anticipated, but we will, we'll get into that. The first bit of news is Mike Thomas, Marshawn Lattimore, Mike Thomas dealing with a knee injury, Marshawn Lattimore dealing with an ankle injury. And, you know, I think it was fair to wonder, you know, this was the first press conference back, you know, because so you had that kind of week where it was like, okay, with that extra week, are you going to be in a situation where maybe that extra week allowed you to get better and be healthy and be on time and be able to get out to practice? But based on what Dennis Allen said 
it really doesn't sound like that. And so here's here's what he said. Today. Both of those guys are, um, you know, going through the rehab process, and and uh, you know, I think they'll probably miss some time. Yeah, and anytime probably you're just talking, time. yeah, anytime you're just talking about like vague missing time this early in the week, that's not a good sign for the availability. Um, he said he wouldn't. He wouldn't go into whether the either player was an IR candidate, something they, they're going to have to figure out. But I think you're probably going to see one of those players go on IR. Probably, you know, my, the high ankle sprains are tough, you know, and I wouldn't be surprised if Marshawn Lattimore ends on IR. Either way, it's going to be, you know, these next seven games, you're trying to figure out how to get to the playoffs. You're trying to gain some momentum and not having Mike or Marshawn for however long that is definitely a pretty big blow to that. Real big bummer, um, you know, with, with both of them. Obviously, Marshawn, one of the key leaders of that defense, uh, brings that all-pro uh, level to a secondary that's been good this year, but he's definitely that leader leader of that pack over there. And, man, you talk about with Michael Thomas, I think – I don't want to say he did better than expected this season, but I, I thought he was steady Eddie – you know, you know what you could get from Mike, and uh, I know he was frustrated at times. Obviously, in this offense, I think a lot of people were, but o- overall, I-, I was liking his production this season and what what he brought to that offense. As, as I thought, Carr was getting uh, uh, like that realization, like if I need something, Mike's there, and and was something he could lean on because he, there was nobody else over the middle to go to that he was at least going to. I mean, the first two throws of that game were to Mike. In, in you know in contested situations right like there's clearly comfortability that was growing there and yeah so that's that's frustrating i do think that you know if mike had a serious knee injury that that required surgical remediation is the term i'm going yeah. to use then we would know about it by now right so like we haven't you haven't seen any reporting about okay it's a tear or it's a this or it's a that and i think that's a good sign i don't i think that if this was something that you expected him to miss a, the, a good chunk of the remainder of the season, we would know about it by now and you would have put him on injured reserve and you would go from there. To me, he's probably the guy I'd expect back first. Um, ankle injuries are tough. We, we know that from Mike, right? Like you don't want to be in a situation where you're rushing Marjan back and that impacts not only this season, but maybe next season, right? So I think that's going to be the one that you're a little more careful with. Yeah, Marshawn's got to be able to run. So does Mike, obviously. <laughs> yeah, right. Like these are positions where you don't, you know, your ankles are obviously very important. They're important Ankle everywhere. Knees, but, right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so I, I think that you're probably playing it safe with Mike as opposed to Marshawn where the, the rehab process is going to be a little longer. Um, I will say the thing that makes Marshawn's situation a little easier to stomach is I think the Saints are very comfortable with Ike Adam and Alante Taylor as the potential fill-ins. For Marshawn, the question I have is, are you better off throwing Ike Adam out there the way you did in the first four games or whatever it was when Paulson Adebo was out? Or with the extra time this past week, shifting Alante outside full time and figuring out the best option in the slot? Because, and I think we've talked about this, I don't think Alante has thrived in the slot. And I think this is kind of a good opportunity to see what he has on the outside and what that pairing of Paulson Adebo and Alante Taylor will look like. Um, you know, we saw it in stretches last year, but I'd like to see Alante kind of come into his own and, and play. So I wouldn't be surprised if you move like an Ugo Amadi or maybe a Jordan Howden, maybe just kind of see what he has in the slot. But I, I think you're probably going to lean toward Ugo Amadi. Um, but based on what DA said today, I think that's that may be where you're leaning because when he when he was asked about it, he said there will be somebody playing out there. Well, I have a plan for guys to go in there and play. I think we've got some good options in the secondary, guys that can play corner, nickel, those types of things. Now, Ike isn't a nickel corner. Ike is an outside corner. So, and he was asked the question he was answering was whether you were going to turn to Ike in that role, the same way you turned to him when Paulson was out. And he responded with a note about 
guys who can play outside in the nickel. So to me, I think that indicates that you're leaning toward Alante and um, you know, maybe that is your best option. You go from now. Either way, that's going to be something to watch. And it's going to be a big factor over the next few games because, you know, Marshawn's able to take away one side of the field. Whichever side you want to take away is going to take it away. I don't think teams are going to be as hesitant to throw it. I get him. In fact, I know they won't be because he had people throwing at his way relentlessly when Paulson was out, right? He played well. Um, but that's going to be a factor. If you can't shut down the passing game the way you have, then things are going to get a lot more difficult for you. You you, you went through, obviously, everything uh, going on with the cornerback spot, possibly, you know, with Marshawn having to miss time. But then you also, too, look with wide receiver uh, brought up that Marquez Callaway back in, back in the locker room for the black and gold. Yeah, Marquez is back. Mr. Callaway. You know, I walked in there and I saw him. And I was like, who is that guy? He looks familiar, but I don't right. know. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, we've, seen, we've seen him plenty. You know, he was with the Broncos earlier this season. I think he latched on maybe the Seahawks. I can't recall. He was on a different practice squad for a couple weeks and then got cut. And so, yeah, they brought him back. They also re-signed Keith Kirkwood, who was cut prior to week 10 uh, to make room for Adam Prentice. Adam Prentice was now, is now on the practice squad. So, yeah, those are the two options that you have. And, you know, he's a guy who knows the offense. It's not going to be much of a ramp up for him. So that's helpful. Um, and yeah, if it's a, if it is like a one to two week thing, you're expecting to be without Mike, then that makes sense. And you can get a guy who you are going to trust if you do need to call on him. I think A.T. Perry is going to continue to be the right, guy. Right. That was how I was going with that next. Yeah, that you fill in there with. But yeah, Marquez is, is obviously kind of an option. I wouldn't be surprised if Keith Kirkwood ends up being inactive and you bring up Marquez anyway. Um, but you know, that's, yeah, that's going to be something. The other guy they signed Jason Pierre, Paul, uh, onto the practice squad, you know, it's, it's what you would expect. He's a veteran player. The DA used the term skins on the wall, which, you know, is a Bobby a bear special. I'm sure he'll be thrilled to hear that one. Um, and yeah, I think it's just a question. Okay. What is, what does JPP have left in the tank? I think he'll be a practice squad call up this week. And then, you know, as DA said, it's basically like, okay. And then you move forward and maybe there's a spot on the active roster. Um, I think it is likely he ends up on the active roster. And the question is, who falls in the rotation um, to make room for him? Isaiah Foskey, you'd imagine, is hopeful. You're hopeful to get him back. He didn't go on IR. So, you know, that's going to be an interesting an interesting numbers game as you go down the stretch is how do you get Jason Pierre-Paul on the field if he is up to the level where you feel like you want to be playing him? Does Tano Passigno's role kind of get limited in some way? Um, obviously cam i think you're gonna dial back his snaps somewhere um but yeah so jpp uh, i'm excited to see him out there yeah definitely curious to see what a guy like him brings right now i i think we talked about a little bit you're not expecting you know him to be that wrecking ball of a guy he was before because come on the guy was just you know sitting on his couch i don't know about sitting on his couch but he was at home not playing any football for the first half of this season. And so he's not coming in to, you know, amp up these sack numbers that have been lacking for the Saints. But if he can provide some kind of spark or help give, you know, depth and relief to the guys in the rotation, definitely all about it because w what else has to lose right now? Because I just, you know, I think Dennis Allen talked about it today too. Just, they want to amp up the pressures. They want to amp up, of the amount of, you know, those sack numbers against quarterbacks because they have not been able to hit home on them. Maybe you know, they've gotten pressures, but man, the, those sacks, the, the the numbers haven't been there this season, which is really odd considering the turnover numbers were up. It will affect the quarterback a little bit more from a pressure standpoint. Um, I don't think it's been um, what we need it to be. Um, and so, you know, that's obviously something that, that you know, we've put a – Put a lot of thought into, and and uh, we'll need to affect the quarterback more from a pressure standpoint. You know, in the second half of the season. Yeah, I mean, I think they they have put pressure on quarterbacks to some extent, and like you mentioned, yeah, the, the interception numbers are up. It's not like you hit the quarterback every time he throws an interception, but when you put pressure on quarterback, make them make some questionable decisions, and you have the defensive right, the back can go faster. Right. Like, so th there, there is a, there is a level to which you're kind of like, okay, you know, even if you don't get a sack here, you are affecting the equation in, in a way that's positive and allows your defensive backs to make plays. 
that hasn't happened enough, right? You haven't seen that enough, even though the interception numbers are there. There's just too many times where you're just seeing a quarterback stand in the pocket. And it's really the difference between, you know, like there was a third down play in the, in that game against the Vikings uh, on opening drive, right? Third and five, Derek Carr, he's kind of waiting. He has Rashid coming across the middle. He has Juwan Johnson ready to break open on the backside, but he gets pressure right in his face and, and he's not able to extend that play, right? And so if he can extend for maybe a half second, Rashid can clear the linebacker and you can hit him and it's a first down. Maybe he maybe he breaks a tackle and runs for a touchdown. Instead, it's 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 a you know, not a throwaway. He tried to make the throw, but he was unable to because he had a guy in his face and he missed, right? And that's the difference between a defensive line that disrupts the play and forces you to go off schedule, and a defensive line that allows you to move around and extend plays, and then guys come open, right? Then you can create off schedule. And that's what the Saints have allowed way too much on defense and haven't done well enough on offense. So that's why you bring in a guy who is not like, I think we talked about this last week. He's not going to be a rundowns guy. He's going to be a situational pass rusher if he is on the field and it is directly aimed at, we have to generate more pressure. We are not getting it done with how we're doing it. And do you, do you add him as kind of a Sam linebacker, right? He's played outside linebacker. He, he probably could fill that role. If you're, if you're talking about, third and long where you're looking at pass downs or you're going to bring five, you know, stuff like that. I think you're going to get a little more creative the same way you did last year when Marshawn was out and you ended up with Caden Ellis kind of racking up sacks in the second half of the season. So that's going to be one thing. Um, one more note before we move on, Derek Carr still in the concussion protocol. I, I very much expect him to play. I do not think that it's going to be an issue in terms of he's going to be out of practice on Wednesday. He'll probably be limited, um, but that's kind of just the steps of clearing the concussion protocols. You have to go through practices, and so they can't. You you can't clear the concussion protocol without practicing. So regardless of how he feels right now, he's still in the protocol. He has to get through a practice first before he can be cleared. Um, so I don't know at what point this week he's gonna be cleared, but based on what we're hearing and you know any everything else. I don't expect that. Like, I think he's going to start this week. And I don't think there's much question within the building that he's going to start this week. Um, but like the protocol is the protocol and you have to go through the steps. I think he's fine. Um, so that's, that's at least some positive injury news, unless you are a Jameis Stan and wanted to see Jameis. I don't think you're going to see Jameis. No, I know we were not going to see Taysom. I can't get enough of him as it is now. We're going to see Taysom. I mean, he's not going to start, but we're going to see Taysom, especially it, you better see Taysom in this matchup because if there's any team in the NFL <laughs> that has been unable to – like one don't, of the things you look – Don't you, tell your silly stats to Pete Carmichael and Dennis Allen. They don't want to hear them. Well, it's not even about those stats. I don't, I think that stat is stupid. It's not a. It's just kind of an arbitrary number where like, oh, if you got six rushes instead of seven, then your odds – that doesn't change anything. You, you want to use him, and if it ends up being seven, that's great. One of the wins he's had he where he had an impact was last year in week one where he ran for like 83 yards on something like three carries, but he changed the game when he got in there. And so, like, if you go back, and I'm, I'm going to pull these stats together for the for later in the week. I don't have them right now. But, you know, the one of the things about division matchups is they know what you're going to do. Right. Like that's, that's the, there's the wild card of some of these matchups. You go and face the Vikings, you don't face them every year. And so you're kind of trying to scout and figure out what they're going to do. And you're not familiar with the offense, this and that. These teams know each other. These teams know what the other team is trying to do. And they still can't stop Taysom Hill. Right. Like they've been trying to figure that out for years and they haven't stopped it. So no, this match killer of all the matchups where you could be like, I wonder if they're going to use Taysom Hill and how much this. This is a matchup where there's no way you go into it without Taysom being a huge part of the game plan. Not a, not, not a situational part of your game plan, a huge part, right? I don't care about seven. He should get 10 carries. He should be here running back for Christ's sakes. I don't care. <laughs> this is a game where you have to get Taysom Mill involved um, in whatever way that looks early and often um, because they haven't stopped him. They've had game. It doesn't matter whether he's starting. doesn't matter whether he's – with Drew Brees, doesn't matter whether he's with Jameis Winston, doesn't matter what was it, Trevor Simeon and the other one. Like, they can't stop him. 
Uh, so yeah, I don't know. That's a tangent, but yep. It'll be interesting to see, obviously too, uh, you know, Ryan Nielsen's game plan for attacking the saints. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, that's going to be something. Yeah. I want to get into that more on Wednesday, but it's, that's going to be obviously a really fascinating subplot of this game. Yeah. Um, in terms of how the saints adjust to a guy who knows what they want to do offensively. Everything right? they want to do. Right knows everything <laughs> um, like, you know he, he knows the signals right he knows you know they're gonna have to figure out ways to adjust um and uh yeah well i mean the panthers i mean I'm sorry not the panthers the the falcons are in just as bad shape as the saints in terms of what they've done the last several weeks you're gonna have desmond ritter back in there taylor heineke started two games i'm disappointed in that actually i'm not i think the saints are better off facing desmond ritter than than taylor heineke I don't know anymore just because of Heineke's, uh, uh, I mean, Ritter's mobile ability scares me now. They're going to run regardless. It's not <laughs> like, they, like they, you know, they're going to run. It's not a question of whether Ritter can be mobile. I, Ritter doesn't scare me in the slightest. I'm not worried about Desmond Ritter at, at all. Um, uh, I, I didn't think Josh Dobbs was going to look like um, Michael Vick running to the outside. So I, I, I hope that Ritter doesn't either. either. Ritter's doesn't, he's not that type of runner. You know, he's he's closer to a Cam Newton kind of runner. You know what I mean? Like, like there's there's kind of jitterbug quarterbacks where they're you know like Lamar, where it's like he's he's just more athletic than you, and he's gonna like juke you and get out of the way. Like Desmond is more of a big a big strong running quarterback where if you give him space, he's gonna he's gonna take it, but he's not gonna be like kind of juking people in the backfield and doing all that. Um, I actually don't think Desmond is as good of an athlete as people give him credit for, but we'll, we'll see. He did run for a touchdown against the Cardinals in that game that they lost to Kyler Murray and the Cardinals. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, let's wrap up that segment. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about, okay, what do the Saints need to do over these next seven games? Like, what do they need to do better over these next seven games to 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 make the playoffs and get there and feel like they have a chance to do something? I don't know. Um, but this is Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He is Steve Geller. We'll be right back. And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He's Steve Geller. And the Saints are heading up to Atlanta to face the Falcons. And the 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 Falcons, or Mercedes-Benz Stadium, is apparently celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop on Sunday, which I don't know what that means. And not, not in the sense of, I don't know what hip hop is. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not a list of, of, of artists. And I don't know if that means that they're going to be performing. There's like dozens of them, you know, but I guess they're going to be there. I don't know. It's weird, but it's gonna be it's gonna be something. It's uh, Atlanta's always they, they're trying they to have, attention they, away from the fact their team sucks by putting all this stuff going on. They do have that in-house DJ, right? Maybe that's what they're playing. See, I don't know. That's what makes it so confusing. They just put out this list of maybe they're playing. Uh, I don't know. Either way, that's gonna be something. I guess uh, the Saints need to go up there and win. So hopefully, the Falcons are satisfied with their hip hop thing and they can feel good about that as they lose uh, another game at home to the same ludicrous going to be there at least it, he is on this list yes all right there you go i mean i can read you some of the names you know uh boys in the hood <laughs> bubba sparks CeeLo green them franchise boys uh let's see there's several others jermaine dupree Jeezy, the ludicrous, Rich Homie Kwan. How about Ying Yang twins? Young Jock. Nope, no Ying Yang twins. But yeah, so apparently they're doing that. If that means something to you, I'm happy for you. But I, I always yeah. thought that was funny. Obviously, Ying Yang twins, stand up and get crunk, an Atlanta band, but that became such a New Orleans anthem. I have seen Ying Yang twins live three times all three times for free <laughs> i saw them 
twice. Uh, there's a bar called the Boathouse in Myrtle Beach, uh, where they would just put on free concerts, you know. And so it was uh, the the funny thing is like they don't have a lot of songs where they're alone. They don't have a lot of Yin Yang twin songs. It's always like, you know, call a park, Bubba Sparks, you know, and then Yin Yang twins show up, right? <laughs> like they will play like booty, 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 rocking everywhere. <laughs> and but it's like they have to play that part because Bubba Sparks isn't there. It's just the Yin Yang twins. The only song that they can play really that's just them is like the Whisper song, which really doesn't translate live. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's very funny i also saw them once in new orleans it was at a i think a pygmalion festival like one of the festivals after the pr- parade where they like all of the crews show up and i got a wristband and we went and it was, you would you wouldn't you know it the uh the act is yin yang twins uh like they they like i think they do from, from the window to the wall right they do they're on like a couple little john songs it's right. just very funny because they have they, they do their part but then the rest is played Anyway, that's that's it. That's all I got. The Yin Yang twins won't even be there. Um, but yeah, you know, and they're not twins. What what a shame! A, 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 an Atlanta band they're not even inviting. <laughs> yeah, no one. They didn't get the they didn't get the memo. They couldn't make it. Um, okay, so you know, so the, the whole point of this segment is not about talking about hip hop. It's about talking about what do the Saints need to do better, and and it has to start right away because you know this is a situation the saints are in where you can look at it and say you know that everything is out in front of them and 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 you're right and they should feel that way but a loss to atlanta to drop to five and six and in the process drop to second in the nfc nfc south because right now the saints have a full game lead that that only lasts until you lose to the team that's behind you and then you would lose the tiebreaker so a loss in this game would feel devastating after losing to the Vikings the way you did, sitting there two weeks later and, and coming out with a loss to this division rival who ne- then then would be in first place in the division, right? Uh, that's not what you want. So, you know, so so what are, what are the keys to A, not losing this game and B, not losing the rest of your games? And I mean, the, it, it really is, you know, coming out fast. It's like, it sounds so simple, but like, man, you can't continue to allow long drives for touchdowns the entire first half. <laughs> you can see the offense needs to be better, but I'm looking at the defense and, and we talked about this. If they can't shore up their red zone defense in the first half, you're going to lose a lot of football games. You cannot allow an 80% success rate in the red zone on defense, which is what the saints have allowed over their last five games. And it's like, I don't, you, you, you drives happen. you, you will not get off the field three and out on every possession. But you also cannot allow touchdowns on every possession. And that's what happened against the Vikings. And that's why you lost that game in the first half. Because not only did you allow them to drive the field in these long possessions, they ended up in the end zone uh, on all but the first one. And the first one, you know, there was a questionable non-pass interference call. They drove the field on that one too, but it ended in a field goal. And if you had ended up with two more of those types of drives, then you would have been right in that game. But no, they went down, touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. And it was basically over. 21 points in the first half on three drives cannot happen. And so you look at that and you say, okay, what do you, what do, you do differently? Well, you know, <laughs> you have to keep things in front of you, which they have done, but you also have to tackle. Like you, you can't allow a two yard run to turn into a six yard run, right? You, you get the quarterback in the backfield. You can't allow him to scramble out and turn a four yard loss into a five yard gain or even a two yard gain. That's how you get these 12 play drives, right? Because that's what it has been. It has not been a lot of explosive plays. Go back throughout the first 10 games. Where are the explosive plays? You don't see them like the uh, Christian Kirk against the Jags. That was an explosive play, but even that was a short a short throw and a catch and run like you have not seen deep balls against this saints defense other than, you know, the Packers game, you could say that there was a couple pass interference calls that qualified as explosive plays because you just allowed them to happen. But in the most part, it's been just execution, execution, execution underneath. And, you know, three yard, three plays, first down, three plays, first down, three plays, first down. So that's what has to change is you have to a get off the field and B when you don't get off the field right away, you cannot just fold and allow allow easy touchdown drives. And, you know, it, there's a lot that goes into that. But if you can 
get that 80% success rate in the first half down to, I don't know, it doesn't even have to be low. It can be 50. That, you probably win some of these games that you lost if you can be closer to 50% allowing touchdowns in the red zone on defense. What's wild is obviously we know we, we talked about it a ton, obviously with the slow starts with the team. And it's like, how, how do you get that second half mentality or whatever mindset or groove that they're, they're able to get in? And I, I think, you know, we mentioned it as well, too. Obviously, the offenses might be a little more conservative that they're playing in that second half, depending on what's going on. But I, uh, overall, you see a more significant uh, change when it comes to you even mention, you know, getting off the field, getting three and outs come the second half, where as in the in the first half of games, they've just been looking like doormats. And it's I just I'm, I don't have any kind of explanation for it. And we haven't heard it from coach or the players either. No, there there really is no explanation because I think it's just a lot of it is just, you know, have some pride, right? Like go out there and make a tackle for Christ's sake. Like, you know what you're doing? Like this defense knows what it's doing. This is not a rookie laden defense. This is not a new oh, scheme. Right. Not a lot of new players, right? It's just guys who need to go out there and, and execute their jobs. And I think that's why the coaching staff gets frustrated when they get those questions because like, and, and it, you know, it, it is funny and we've talked about this, but it's so true. Like, what do you think is happening in the locker room? Honestly, like, seriously, when people come out and say halftime adjustments, what exactly do you think is happening in the locker room? Like by the, like, like look at the clock when the, when the second quarter ends and they flash up, what, 12 minutes, 15 minutes. <laughs> like, I, I don't even know how long halftime technically is, but they start the timer right away. And when the timer is done, the third quarter starts. So like you, you, you leave the field, you got to walk all the way to the locker room. It's not like right outside the door. It takes a little bit of time to get there. You get to the, it's like, you go to the bathroom, right? You gotta, you get a bottle, like a drink of Gatorade. <laughs> what do you think they're doing at that point? Do you right. Think there's not this big screen where they're calling up new plays and <laughs> yeah. breaking down the film of the first half. <laughs> I think they got lifelines. I think they're doing like phone a friend. It, no, it's not. It's it's a lot of it is just guys. This is the game. Like you're, you're reminding people in most cases more than anything else, and you're making minor adjustments, but you're not changing anything. And, and then you come out and you play better. But it's not about changing the scheme. It's just about playing better. It's about doing your job and executing. And you know that's part of the reason when I when we talked about Alante, I don't think Alante has been very good in the slot, and I think. You have an opportunity here to put him in a position that he feels a little more comfortable in and maybe figure some things out in the slot with somebody else. But I, do, I just don't think that's been working. And, you know, that, that touchdown where you talk about Josh Dobbs looking like Superman, the reason that touchdown happened yeah. is because Alante did not play it well. And he's not a guy who should be getting out running. Like I've talked about team defense and, you know, what or team speed on defense and that they don't have enough of it. Well, he is not an example of not having enough team speed on defense. He should be the guy who can make that play. And he just didn't. And I just don't think he feels comfortable in that position. It was an idea. You put him there. It has not really worked. And so right now, I think you want to be trying to find another option. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I just don't think, I think he's kind of losing confidence there. It's just not a good situation to be in for a young player who was in a position battle and now is in a new position that he's just not thriving in. So, you know, I, I don't know if a guy like Ugo Amati or Jordan Howden will be better, but I do think that in order, you know, to build the confidence of a young player, I want to put him in a position where he feels comfortable. And right now I think that's on the outside for Alante and you've had two weeks to, you know, you, you knew where, where Marshawn stood in terms of probably wasn't going to be back this week. So right. you had the opportunity to say, okay, Alante, we're going to shift you back outside. You have two weeks to kind of get prepared. And, you know, obviously you want to give these guys some time off. I don't think, you, you know, like I think he had a few extra assignments over this break. And that's why I think you're probably going to see him go outside because earlier in the season when you did it, you, you did it kind of, you kind of half-assed it, right? Like you wanted to keep Alante on the field. So in base packages, you would have him outside. And then in nickel, you would have him inside and it just didn't work. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, you know, that's that's something that I think you really kind of need to figure out. I, I, I'm curious to see if it is, ends up being Alante outside, just because of the fact that I'm not saying he wasn't on board with 
the switch to the you know the nickel roll but he i don't i don't think he was ever in, in thrilled or you know looking forward to taking it on it was like all right this is where they want me this is where they need me i'm going to do it but i always got that sense of man i'd re- i'd rather be outside yeah i think any i think any cornerback who says they wouldn't rather be outside is lying to you <laughs> Seriously. I mean, that's not, you didn't come up as a cornerback and say, yeah, I ever desperately want to cover tight ends. You didn't like, that's just not how it works. Um, and so like, he's a team guy. He'll do it. He'll do the job. I just don't know. If, I just don't think it's working. Um, and you know, that, that position in this defense is very important. That's why I was really annoyed to see CJ go. I understand why CJ left, but I just think from a just cohesion perspective, that's a position that takes so many tasks that are not simple, that are not just rep based. They have to react, right? They have to, they have to be ahead of the game. And, you know, like that the, the, the interception against the Bucks a few years ago, where she did just baited Tom Brady to throw to Scotty Miller. And then he just like broke on it and got like, that's the type of play that you can make in the slot that it's like, it's subtle, but not everyone makes that play. Right. And I just think it's just not, it's not, it's not, it's not working. So, uh, I mean, we don't need to get any more of it than that, but I do think that that has been that position, not being as elite as you are used to has, has been a struggle. And I think it was a struggle last year. And I think it's been, it's more, it's more of a struggle this year. Um, so you got to figure it out. The other thing that I think this team needs to do from a, just an overall team perspective is This team plays, and this is stupid, but it's true. This team plays much better with a lead than it does when it's it's trying to play from behind, right? And, and, And I mean, I think that's probably true of a lot of teams. But when this team is playing downhill, it's a much better football team. You look at the wins and the losses, right? The Saints, four of their five wins, they have been ahead at halftime, right? So that's the... um. That's the Panthers. They're ahead by three. The Patriots are ahead by 17. I'm sorry. Let's scratch that. I did that backwards. Okay. Four of the five losses, they have been behind at halftime, right? So that's the Vikings. They were down by 21. The Jags, they were down by 11. The Texans, they were down by seven. The Bucks, they were down by 11. Now in three of those four games, the Saints made it a game. Like they were, they were close, but they were trying to climb uphill the whole way and they just never could get over the top. The only loss that they were ahead at halftime was against the Packers. And that's kind of an asterisk. Like we can say that's a bad loss, but at the same time, you play the second half without your quarterback, weird things happen. Um, But like those three losses, the Texans, Vikings, and Jags, they're not bad losses. Like you're not looking at a a team that's lost a lot of bad games, right? The Bucs game is kind of notwithstanding, but it's a divisional game. Weird things happen in divisional games. Um, And so like, you look at this, and it's not its not a matter of them losing to bad teams. Again, the Packers game notwithstanding, for obvious reasons. It's about not beating good teams. And why are you not beating good teams? Well, because you're getting off to a slow start, and you're playing from behind. The games they have won, four of those five games, they were either tied or ahead at halftime. So that's the Panthers, where they were up by three. The Patriots, where they were up by 17. The Colts, where they were up by one. And the Bears game, which they were tied. Right, And they played a majority of the second half from in front. The only game that they won where they were behind at halftime was week one against the Titans. They were down six to three. And even then it's like, yeah, that's barely, you might as well be zero, zero at that point. It's not a huge difference. Um, and they, and they played from ahead for a majority of the second half of that game. And so like that, this team, I think in the in, you know, it's funny because they've started the last few games without the ball. And I think deferring to the second half is a luxury you have when you do not start slow. And I, I just think if they win the coin toss in this game in Atlanta, they need to take the ball and take they need to right. go score. I want to see this team play from ahead, and I want to see them. They want to see them making decisions as a team that knows they need to be aggressive early in the game and get out in front and play from in front. Because when they play from in front and they build confidence and they force the other team to actually do stuff other than one read and run, they're a much better football team. So to me, that's a big part of it. It's like if you want to win more games. Stop trying to win from behind. And it's like, yeah, every game you'd love to be ahead and win the entire game end to end. But I do think that there's not, it's not a coincidence that you're getting behind in these games and you're losing these games. 
Um, so yeah, score more points on the other team. That's the big difference. No, and I, we talked a little bit about you know you, aggre- you want aggressiveness. T- Taysom Hill is that big, you know, that physical yeah. presence that can can give you that. Um, I thought Jamal Williams would be more of that, but still has not come to fruition yet. I don't know what the deal has been with with, with Williams this year. I, I, I hope that maybe this last stretch something can turn on for him in this run game though in general hasn't been anything spectacular but i I did think a guy that was coming in that scored 17 touchdowns in detroit would be doing something by now yeah it hasn't i mean and i will say you haven't really had red zone running opportunities for him and when you have they've been going to taste him it's you know in in hindsight the signing feels like it doesn't make a ton of sense right like his his it's kind of got a redundant skill set when you are using Taysom the way you are um like did you need to sign a guy for a three-year 12 million dollar contract to be a blocker like I feel like you could find a fullback like the, it's just it, it doesn't I don't it doesn't make sense how they're using him it doesn't make sense you know and he hasn't been productive in the times they have used him right like if you're gonna be a short yardage guy you gotta pick up short yardage you know and when you don't it's just like, well, why are you here? Um, like that was the third down play to start the second half against the Vikings. It was like third and one. This is quite literally why they brought you in. Um, and you can't pick it up. And like part of that's on the line, right? Like it's not all on the running back. But when you haven't really done anything else and you get a short yardage opportunity and don't convert. And then the plan on fourth down is to go to Taysom anyway. It's just, I don't know. It's it's not really working out. Uh so I, I I don't know. We'll see. Maybe maybe he'll he'll find his rhythm and you'll you'll get a little bit more. But it's that's been that's been disappointing to, to say the least. What what I will say is, you know, on offense, I think even without Mike Thomas, I want to see them get more to the quick passing game. I want to see you doing to other teams what other teams have been doing to you, right? Which is just you know get the ball out quickly. It, I and I and it's and it's annoying because. It doesn't always work, and people will complain that it's that it's you know check down Derek and Captain check down and all of this. I think this offense works better when Derek's not st- standing in the pocket, waiting for someone to wipe him out. Right? I want to see the screens haven't worked. They need you need to run screens. You need to be better at running screens. It's not about well they haven't worked, so we're going to stop doing them. No, you got to work on it. You got to get better at it because those are key plays in this offense. You got to be able to execute them. Um, like there, in and part of it was you know in this last game, it's a little different, and Jameis isn't necessarily in there with the timing. Um, he's not getting the first team reps in practice, so when they try to run the screen, screens are all about timing and getting the ball where it needs to be. Other, it's so like it's not all on Jameis, not all on Al, it's not all on the offensive line. It's got to be a group effort, and the, the screens they ran in the second half of that game just did not work. Um, a lot of that was on the blocking, so it, it's. I don't know. It, you you got to run them and you got to be better at them. And to me, that's a big part of it. And that helps you, you know, when you're converting first downs instead of losing two yards on those plays, offense gets so much easier because it's just, there's, there's moments where you just demoralize a defense. And it just feels like when you're watching a game and a team runs a screen and it works and the defense tires itself out running up field and then turns around, it's like, son of a bitch. You know, like, like those are moments that I feel like like they, they, their body blows in a fight and you haven't gotten those you've gotten these big boom or bust plays, but you haven't gotten those just kind of like, you know, where, where you counter what they're doing and it works and you feel like, yeah, got them, you know, like you just haven't seen that with the saints offense and it's gotta be better. And, you know, that goes on Pete Carmichael, that goes on Derek, that goes on, you know, whoever's in there. Um, they just haven't had enough of those moments. And so that to me, that's, you know, I, I just think, Getting into the right situation and beating the defense where they are is something that I just haven't seen enough of. No, there haven't been very many, if any, explosive plays to talk about this season. Um, you know, no, they've had a, they've had explosive plays. I I just, I just agree with that. They've had explosive plays, but maybe they haven't like finished. I, I don't. I don't. I'm not in the run game at all. Well, sure, in the run game, the run game's different. But I mean, what's an explosive play in the run game? But I mean, you know, I'll take a twenty-plus yard run. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, I, yeah. I guess if you're talking about the run game, sure. But um, 
let's see. 20 plus yard plays. The Saints have 28 of them, which is kind of middle of the road in the NFL. 40 plus yard plays. The Saints have eight of them, which is second in the NFL. Um, so, I mean, like they've had explosive plays. We've seen explosive plays, but we just haven't seen like 10 to 10 to 20. Like I want 10 to 20 yard plays that are not just Chris Olave, you know, on a, on a dig. Like I want to see them get to that in other ways. So I, I agree with that, but the, they have made explosive plays down the field. Well, again, who, only one team has more 40 plus yard plays in the NFL. Who do you think ends up getting into Mike's role? At least initially, who gets like the 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 first look? Would it be you know Perry because he's had that more time, or do you do you look at someone like a Kirkwood? Well, I mean, I guess there's two questions. One is who's playing the X, and what are you running with primary reads in terms of okay who's the who's the first option second option third option are you flipping things in certain instances because you have AT Perry playing X and that would typically be the first read but because Mike's not there you're kind of flipping the the, the progression so I I think you will have AT Perry playing the X receiver um, because I think that's what he's been repping uh, Rashid has mainly been Z slot and, and Chris has been kind of doing the same thing. Um, so I think that's where you're going to, but you're going to see a lot more targets for like, I, I don't think AT is going to get a ton of targets, but I think he's going to take Mike's role in the, in that part of the field. So I would guess that AT is the one that's going to be on the field the most. Um, I don't think Kirk's get, Kirkwood's going to be active. Uh, unless, you know, unless maybe things don't go the way you hoped in the beginning of the week and um, you feel more comfortable with Keith in there. But I know I think you're going to see AT get, get that role. Yeah. Uh, just curious, like, you know, what they do wide receiver, you know, the, the rundown now with Mike looking like it's going to be a li- you know, not hopefully not an extended time, but he is going to miss some time. Yeah. No, I, I mean, we'll see. I mean, hopefully maybe uh, shoot Juwan, could get some more targets for crying out loud. You, you know, it, it, it's funny because I had someone reply to a tweet that wasn't even about the tight ends, but uh, they were watching the Broncos game and Adam Troutman caught a couple passes before the first half or before the end of the first half. And it was on the drive where Kevin O'Connell had decided to cowardly punt from the 48 yard line on fourth and one, which always a bad decision. Never do that. Stop punting. In plus territory on fourth and one, go for it. You, I, I could make a very solid that. argument. They lost that game because of that decision. They lost by one point, and you basically gifted the Broncos three points by not running a higher. I mean, what's the percentage on a fourth down, fourth and one? Like seventy percent. Like it's a high percentage play, and it's like so. So measure that against the percentage of pinning a team deep enough that it tangibly affects their ability to drive into field goal range, right? Like, so you're talking about, uh, do you have a better chance of converting on fourth and one or your punter pinning them inside the five? Because I, I, I will assure you that your chances are better of converting a fourth and one. Your punter may pin them within the five, but again, all you can do is make the right decision at the right moment. You can't, you, you can results-based analysis your way out of a paper bag, but you cannot, Tell me that you have a better chance of pinning a team deep than you have of converting a fourth and one because it's not true. Uh, they kicked it into the end zone, so it ended up being a 27-yard net. And the Broncos, with three timeouts, went down the field and kicked a field goal at the end of the first half. Instead of being down 10 to six or worse, they were down 10 to nine and they ended up winning by one. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do it. Stop doing it. It's not that complicated. And it's funny because you talk about Kevin O'Connell. Everyone loves Kevin O'Connell. He makes the right decision. He's a good coach. But even, even good coaches, even the guys talked about as like the, the, the best coaches, are still making these mind-numbingly dumb analytics-blind decisions in the NFL. I don't remember what we were talking about. What were we talking about? We were getting – we got into – God, yeah, how did this get into Denver? 
Sean Payton. Oh, oh, tight ends, tight ends. Tight ends, so there on we that, go. Yeah, right. On that drive for the field goal, someone replied and was like, man, the, the Broncos, this Sean Payton's offense gets the tight end involved <laughs> way more than the Saints does. And and that's not true. I looked at the I looked at go look at the targets, right? And so you look at Adam Troutman. I think you know he ended up with what uh, three targets in that game, four targets. Let's see. Adam Troutman, good old Adam Troutman. He has 15 catches on the year, right? He had two targets in that game. There were those two targets that they saw, and they were like, "Wow, the, the Broncos get the tight ends involved." No, between. Adam Troutman, Chris Manhurts, whoever else on the Broncos, they have like 28 total targets for tight ends in this offense through 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 now 10 games, right? Whereas the Saints, in terms of Taysom Hill, Jawan Johnson, Jimmy Graham with his one target and catch, uh, you know, Foster Morrow, they have in the range of 50, right? So it's funny because you watch the games on TV and you're like, man, the they threw twice the tight end. They they used the tight end. In reality, they don't. The Broncos have not used the tight end. Russell Wilson doesn't throw to the middle of the field. He just did those two times. And because you saw him, you assume it's like, oh, man, they must be doing this. They don't. So I don't know what my point is here. But the, ideally, yes, you would get Jawan Johnson more involved. Um, he was not involved against the Vikings. And without Mike Thomas, yeah, I think you're, you're right. You do want to try to take advantage of the middle of the field with him. Um, I don't know. Something's going on. I don't I don't know if Jawan is is excelling right now in his role. Um and right. you know he's missing blocks, you know, it's I don't know if he's still dealing with getting up to speed from that calf injury and he's just not where he wants to be, but I don't think Jawan it's it's not just that the Saints aren't getting the ball to Jawan. I think it's also Jawan isn't executing as well as he needs to. So that those are both both of those both sides of the equation have to get better. Um, but I don't think Jawan, like we can talk about like they haven't been using Jawan. I don't think Jawan has been putting himself in positions to have success, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean I mean obviously he started out had the injury and all, but I, I thought like last game, even in Minnesota, we were gonna see him get to eat a little, but there hasn't been that game at all this season where he's He's arrived and made his presence felt like whoa that you know what that was a hell of a game from Juwan and and just not what we saw at all from training camp which kind of is that head scratcher and I know training camp doesn't show you everything but it sure looked like he was definitely poised for that that big season I know he had he led the team in touchdowns last year but it seemed like he was going to even elevate bigger than that and, and it just hasn't happened. No, no. He was targeted twice up. The, that's the frustrating thing is he was targeted twice up the seam. It seemed like it, it looked. It seemed it looked like he had some separation, and the balls was just both times it was over his head. And I don't know if maybe he didn't get to the depth, or if the ball was thrown. Like both throws were about the exact same. So something so, was off, right? Yeah, whether that was whether he was just overthrown, or if they, you know, kind of the 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 depth he was supposed to be at wasn't. Yeah. Cra- I, I don't know, but. Uh, Derek had one, Jameis had one, both guys overthrew him slightly. And those, those are the big plays, right? Those are the plays up the seam that you need to see from him because he's the guy who's there. He's the guy who's going to make those plays. And it's the Jared cook plays, right? Like we haven't seen the Jared cook plays. And as much as people didn't like Jared cook, Jared cook opened up a lot of things in this offense for a lot of people, um, up the middle of the field. So, you know, I, yeah, that, that's a, if they can't get Jawan more involved without Mike Thomas out, I, I, I don't know. And again, it's weird because Derek throws has thrown to tight ends consistently. Like it's not like he doesn't in his career hasn't thrown to tight ends. So I don't know. It's that's why I wonder if if maybe there's something on the Jawan side of things that's not clicking. Um, but we'll see. Well, shoot, there's that other guy, Jimmy. If he's not resting, if we could put him in for maybe a catch or two. I think I'm gonna give. I'm I'm gonna. So last year. Uh, I I made the rule that I'm not going to talk about Ian Book anymore because every time I talk about Ian Book, I just say things that are just like, well, why am I talking about Ian Book when he's not doing anything? And I think I'm going to have that rule with Jimmy Graham. So like, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to spend time talking about him because he's a non-factor. It does not matter what I say about Jimmy Graham. <laughs> he's effectively a coach right now. 
Um, still on the roster. Uh, he's, and he's and props stretch. for Jimmy pimping out getting a Veterans Day rest on Wednesdays. I mean, I don't think he minds getting paid. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, if you need me, I'll be here. You know, and if not, cool. Yeah, which not. Um, all right, let's wrap up that segment. We're gonna come back. I want to kind of reset. Okay, what are the games coming up? What where where do the Saints need to be? Right, what what do they need to be looking at in these next few games? Um, and you know, will the saints consider staffing changes? I think is a, is a good question, but we'll, we'll get into that when we come back. This is inside black and gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He's Steve Geller. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. Otherwise stick around. And we're back on inside black and gold. One more segment here. And you know, I, I, I put up a column today. I don't write a lot of columns, but I just felt like it's the bye week and I just need to get things off my chest. And, you know, you look at this yeah. same team and you talk about, okay, well, you know, they're not as good as you had hoped. They're not as bad as, as they could be. So where are we? What, what, what are you looking at? And you think at a certain point, it's just like, okay, they're five and five through 10 games. Again, like we talked about, they don't have bad losses. Like again, like so you're talking about the Jags, the Vikings, and the Texans. I don't know if you've watched the Texans recently. They've continued to play well. CJ Stroud is playing like a freaking MVP candidate right now. Although th- this past week, notwithstanding, I think he had three interceptions this past week. They won the game. They had three interceptions. Uh, you know, the Jags obviously are gonna win the AFC South, right? The Vikings, you know, they lost to the Broncos on Monday night, or on Sunday night football, close game, but they're one of the hottest teams in football. They're probably gonna make the playoffs. So you look at the other two. Tampa Bay, it's a division game, right? I'm never going to say like, well, there's no chance that the other team wins a division game. Uh, you don't want to get beaten the shit out of you at home, but either way, it's like, you know, things happen in division games. And then the Packers game where you lost, you blew a 17 point lead, right? So you look at those five losses and you're like, yeah, I, I, I keep hearing like, this is such an easy schedule and they should be way better than they are. And I agree with that. But at the same time, where are the bad losses, right? Where are the losses that you can't look at and be like, well, that's a playoff team. That's a playoff team. Well, if we had the starting quarterback, we probably would have won that, you know, and then the Bucks game. Sure. You should have played better, but again, you know, you could pin that on the injury. You could pin that on whatever. Um, you know, i say this a lot. If all you do is beat the teams you're better than you're probably a playoff team, right? If you only, if you're a team that beats bad teams, you're probably a playoff team. And I, I think for the Saints organization, five and five is not the end of the world. But you have seven games remaining here, right? Like you, this is a seven game stretch to decide who you are as a team. And that's how this team is going to look at it. That's how this, the ownership is going to look at it. You know, that's how the front office is going to look at it. You have a seven game stretch against six sub 500 teams and one Lions team that I think you match up pretty well against, right? And so how you do over those final seven games is going to inform pretty much all of your decisions going forward. If you can't get to nine and eight, right? And it's not even, I'm not even going to put a number on it. I'm not going to say either you get to this point, you get to this record, or you're fired, right? But if you're talking about nine and eight, then, then you can stomach it. And you probably win the division, you get to the playoffs. And I think you probably make some staffing changes in terms of, okay, we need to re- re- rebuild this offensive coaching staff. We need to do this. We need to do that, whatever. Um, but like you can, you, can, you can get on board with it in terms of, okay, you've improved year over year. You're going to keep going. This idea that there's you know, this weak schedule, right? Like you've, you've found a way and you've gone and what, whatever. It, if you can't do that, it's not even about the record. It's about the fact that you couldn't go over 500 against a group of teams with a 30% winning percentage, right? And and that's that's the Bucks, the Panthers, two games against the Falcons, the Giants, and the Rams. None of those teams has a has more than four wins right now, right? And you couldn't go over five hundred against those teams. And if that's the case, then yes, you fire everybody, right? Like you you do you have to. But the idea that they should be making that decision right now is 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 silly. It's it's not going to happen. First of all. And second of all, it's like, does that even make sense? Like, I see a lot of people saying, like, we know who Dennis Allen is. We know who this team is. But it's like, do you? 
Do you really? Because this is the first time they've been in this situation. This is the first time you've been in kind of a gut check. Okay, let's go and win this thing. So how do you know? You don't. It's just become in vogue to say, you know, we've seen this all before. We know how it's going to end. You don't know how it's going to end. You're making that up. But but it's 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 cool to be negative. And it's like, uh, I remember after the Saints lost in the AF, in the divisional round of the playoffs in 2020, I had at least two people text me and were like, ah, see, I told you, Drew, Drew couldn't get it done. Drew wasn't good enough to get it done. And, and I was like, what do, you, what do you mean? He wasn't good enough to get it done. It was like, you didn't predict that Jared Cook was going to fumble. You, like, you, you didn't predict that the, the refs were going to have a temporary insanity and not call the most obvious pass interference call of all time. You didn't predict that Marcus Williams was going to forget how to tackle in the last 10 seconds of a playoff game, right? No, you 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 were negative the entire way through. And then, but that's the high percentage play, right? Like that doesn't mean you were right, just means you played the odds. And and now you've waited until long enough. So like people are gonna be fine, like, see, I told you. I was like, yeah, there's a lot of variables in play here. Like, if this team can go out and win five games down the stretch, you're telling me that that the coach should be fired? No. <laughs> like it doesn't make sense. Like, that's the thing that bothers me. And and like I'm not going to sit here and tell you I know how this is all going to play out, but at the same time, like you got to let it play out, and that's how this team is going to look at it. That's how the front office is going to look at it, and they're going to say, "Okay, we have a chance to go out and do all of the things that we set out to do at the beginning of the year." And like I said, coming on to this, this game against the Falcons is massive. You got to go win this game, and if you can, and you kind of cement your lead in the NFC South, and you've you find ways to beat bad teams down the stretch of the season, then I think you do feel good about what you were able to put on the field this year, and you're going to go forward from that. Now, if you can't, if it, like either you beat the bad teams on your schedule or you are one of them, that's kind of the deal here. Like it's a it's a win or loss league. You don't go out and win one good game and then lose three bad games and say, well, we beat the good team, so we're a good team. It's like, no, you have to be able to beat the bad teams. And then maybe when you get to the point where you can beat the good teams, then you do that and you feel good about it. <laughs> and right now, the Saints are a team that's beaten the bad teams and lost to the playoff teams. That's the story of this season, is they have beaten the bad teams on their schedule and they've lost to the playoff teams. If you can continue to beat the bad teams on your schedule, you're going to win double-digit games this year. You're going to go to the postseason. You're going to see what happens. But, it, uh, you know, and, and, and again, I would be perfectly fine with them getting to the end of the season and deciding they need to make changes. But, like, I just see so many people being, like, giving up on this season in order to to make the point that they don't have a chance. I'm telling you that there's, I don't know. This is a rant with no end. But I, I think that that's where you, that's where I land when I'm, when when I get asked, should the Saints fire their head coach? Should the Saints make sweeping changes on offense. Should the Saints do this and that? And it's, it's like in season, no, absolutely not. Look at the teams who have done that. Like everyone says, well, the Raiders have Antonio Pierce now and they're a completely different group. No, the Raiders played the Jets and the Giants and won those games, which great, good for them. They're not going to win a lot of games down the stretch of this season. Sorry, guys, they're not. They're not going to face Tommy DeVito every week. And you know, you're going to see that this is a team without a coaching staff, right? Look at, look at the, the, the Panthers changed play calling duties from Frank Reich. And you know, who's going to be calling the plays this week, Frank Reich. Uh, you know, it's, it's not as simple as just saying any different person is going to be better. And so saying that a year and a half in, you have all the information you need. is just not true. Like you're going to let this play out and you're going to make your decision and have it be informed by the results of these games. And, you know, I just like, just hope for the best. And and if the worst happens, then you react to it. That's kind of what you have to do. And that's what this team is going to do. And my, the only other thing I'll say is like, you know, what, when you get to the end of this season, you look at it and you say, are we a mediocre football team? And do we need to change things? Because so much of your decision-making has been in, has been pinned on the idea that you are extending a winning culture, that you have a winning culture established and you're going to continue to build off of that. Well, if you can't have a winning culture, you, you, you can't call it a winning culture if you can't go into this season and come out of it with a divisional or a division title and a playoff and a home playoff game. If you can't do that this year, then it's not a winning culture. It is just 
what it is. And you have to look at it and be honest about what it is and make your decision from there. And so I don't think Dennis Allen is guaranteed a third season as the head coach of the Saints. But I think all he really has to do to get there is to just not fall into the obvious pits in front of him. If all they do is avoid the pitfalls, he's probably back next year. Um, and then people are probably going to be annoyed by that, but I think that's the reality. And that's what, when people ask me, do you, I think Dennis Allen's going to be fired? That's what I'm going to tell them. Um, and so that's what this rant was. Yeah. I would hope there's not folks hoping the saints ill will saints fans, hoping the team, you know, craps out the Western way just because they want to change at coach because yeah, that, that would be awful and ridiculous. Come on. Who that nation? I expect better from you. Um, I agree with the fact that I don't think there's any massive changes coming as long as this team can win the division and make the postseason. But if if they don't, I would say all bets are off then uh, because of what was expected, obviously, with the ease of the schedule, with this, oh, hey, things are going to be different with the the quarterback we're bringing in. Um I, I could see Allen in trouble if somehow the, the Saints, you know, completely pitfalled and ended up crapping out, not making the postseason. See, I, I don't think it's necessarily playoffs or bust, right? Because I think that you could feasibly make the playoffs this year with a 7-10 and 10 record in this division. I, I genuinely do. And to me, making the playoffs and having home playoff game under those circumstances, no, it's not enough. I'm sorry. It's not right. Eight and nine. Would be. No, personally. No, I don't think it would be. I think the context matters in this circumstance. And the fact is you have six games you're going to be favored in, or at least should be favored in and one game at home against the team that I think you match up well against. And so if you can't go four and three in those games, that means you lost to you know, and, and like the, the Rams, I think, is a tough game. Like, I'm okay with them losing that game. I'm not okay with you hosting the Giants and losing to a team that's starting Tommy DeVito. And the thing is, that team's still playing hard. They went out and beat Washington this week, a team that should should have felt going into that game like they had postseason hopes. There was four and six. Um, yeah, they were four and six going into that game because they haven't had a bye yet. You know, and, and so, like, no, if you go three and four or with these next seven games and you just look – lackluster and, and lifeless then no no you don't bring the head coach back i don't care if you have a home playoff game it doesn't matter uh because that's just not the not the point but you can go into these next seven games and prove something to yourself and be better and be a good football team and show that you have improved as the season has gone on and if that's the case then yeah by all means bring the guy back right uh i'm just my whole thing is like the idea that you make you've made that decision already no, that's that's just not the case. Um, I did look this up because I was curious, and uh, you know why not? Uh, this was not a stat that existed. I went and looked it up. But so in NFL history, <laughs> there've been two teams to make a Super Bowl after starting five and five. One was the 1975 Rams, which I think I don't think that was St. Louis at that point. Can't remember but it was the Rams in 75. I think it was the LA Rams at that point in 75. So that we've gone full circle with the Rams. Uh, and then in 2001, it was the Patriots, which the Patriots are a really interesting example because that was Bill Belichick who had never before had a winning season. He had gotten, fi- I can't remember if he got fired from the Browns or they, he was terrible for the Browns, ended up with the Patriots, had a losing record in year one. Year two started five and five. They won their final six games. That was obviously Tom Brady who took over for Drew Bledsoe and they went to the Super Bowl and they beat the Rams. Uh, you know, and and I'm not saying that Dennis Allen, I'm not trying to compare Dennis Allen and Bill Belichick at all. Don't don't take that for that. <laughs> I'm just saying that it's interesting to me because I think if you went into that season and you look back at how Patriots fans were reacting to the five and five Patriots under Bill Belichick, a coach who had never won anything. And you'll be like, it's another mediocre football team. They have, you know, and it's just funny because it's like it has happened. You ha- you have had it happen. Now, you know what's never happened is a team going from five and six to the Super Bowl. And that's kind of this what, what the Saints have to do this week is they have to make sure they don't go five and six. Um 
because you know, and, and I'm not saying the Saints have a chance to win a Super Bowl, but I'm not saying they don't either. You know, and and to me, it's like the way I choose to look at things is like if if someone else has done it, it can happen again. Like it's not, you know, I don't want to be the team making history if I don't have to be. Uh, but I do like the idea of like, well, you know, they, you know, when I when I played youth soccer, I was on a bunch of rec teams. And we were terrible. We were god awful. We did not have any business being on these fields, right? Uh, what, the coach wanted to have an eleven on eleven team, and we were not an eleven on eleven group of kids. Uh, and so we would lose all of these games by like twenty. And we would get into halftime, and that's kind of how I sold it to myself that I was going to go out and play. It's like, oh yeah, we got yeah, we, we were losing seven to nothing, but if they scored seven in the first half, we could score seven in the second half. Now that wasn't true, but. <laughs> That's kind of how I sold it to myself. And like that's when you're a team, you, you kind of have to be irrational like that. You need a rational confidence to go out there and feel like, yeah, we 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 should be feel like we're the best team on the field. We should feel like we can go out and win. And you know, that's kind of how how I think this team has to operate. When when you watch this team struggling, it just looks like it doesn't believe in itself. Um, and that's that's something I think that has to change, you know, especially on defense. Like I want I, you know, I, I think there's just a, a lifeless nature to what we saw in the first half against the Vikings, right? Like, it didn't seem like there was any fire. It didn't seem like anyone believed that they were going to win that game. Um, and to, to me, that's like, you got to you gotta have that kind of a rational sense of confidence about yourself. You got you to gotta build that somehow. And so, you know, if this team can win a few games in a row, like look at the Broncos right now. That team isn't any better than it was in week one. They just won a few games and they feel like they can go out and win. Um. So I don't know. Maybe this team can do that. Oh, they need that swag with the, with the last seven games left because there really hasn't been that point, even when things were going well, that, you know, I felt like anybody ever felt that things were clicking. This is the team that we expected to see. It just, it's never come together completely yet. And I guess that's a, a good thing. Maybe that we, we still have more meat on the bone or is it we're never going to get to that meat on the bone at this point? I don't know. There's some spin for you. I like <laughs> it. <laughs> you know, you know the best part about this team is they haven't played well. Right. <laughs> True, though. I mean, I mean, so you could say that, or you could say that we have seen them play as well as they can play. Right. That's and the scary part. Yeah. It, it, so that's that's kind of your balance. Is like, are they are 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 the is the team that we've seen through ten games the peak version of this team, like what Dennis Allen said today is, you know, it's like the first five games, we played good defense. We didn't have good offense. Second five games, we played uh, good offense. We didn't play good defense. And it's just, I, I don't know if that's how it works. Like, it's like, Oh, the good, if the offense the, the, can play like the, the defense and the, like, I don't think that's how math works, but football, you know, math, right. I, I, again, like I said, no NFL team has ever suffered from being irrationally confident about itself. Um, like teams that need to play above their weight in big games are always irrationally confident. Uh, and so, you know, I guess it's like a why not us situation. You know, do you think that Seahawks team that won the week NFC West was was telling itself it didn't have a chance in the playoffs? No, they went out and they won the game, you know, and I don't, not going to talk any more about it than I have to, but like, I think this team has talent on it and they just need to, you need that spark. You need to get it going. And so that's where this is. You got, it's got to start this week, right? Like it can't not start this week. Right. Yeah. The, the, the time for you want to hear any kind of whatever excuse or w reasoning for things. Yeah. It, it's over. The, the breaks through you're five and five. Somehow you're still in first. But you got to maintain it, obviously, and it's coming against someone who's nipping at your heels. <laughs> are they? <laughs> Is that what you consider the Falcons to be right now? <laughs> yeah, Falcons and Bucks are right behind you. I, I kind of see the Falcons and Bucks in like a free fall. <laughs> you know, like since the since the Saints and Bucks played in Week Four, the Bucks have lost. I think they're one and four. Right. Falcons have lost three games in a row. And beat the Bucks. Yeah, the Bucks have lost five of the last six games. They they won three of their first four. When they, they when they beat the Saints, they were three and one. Since that point, they are one and five. The Falcons. 
but it's not like Saints are blowing anybody away either. Come on. They're not, but they they they're 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 at least like we're beating the bad teams is what I'm saying. Is they they beat the bad teams. Like like the Falcons have lost four out of the last five. They lost to the Commanders. They lost to the Titans with a rookie quarterback. They lost to right, the Vikings. So, well, when we were looking at the teams, are you putting Rams in a good team or no? No. All right. So the Rams Saints win this, week. this last stretch should go six and one. That game is weird because it's a Thursday night game and you travel across the country. And there are such things as schedule losses. So that game, it's like if you're if you go five and two and your two losses are to the Lions and the Rams, then you nailed that final seven game stretch in my I would opinion. I would agree with that. If you do better than that and you beat the Rams and you just get on a hot streak and you're only lost to the Lions, you still you 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 uh, exceeded my expectations. I I think again, I wouldn't I think you're more likely to lose one of these games to the Falcons and I think you have a good chance to beat the Lions. I really do. I think that it's going to beat the Lions. Um and and you're going to figure that out. Um but, you know, I, like if to me 5 and 2 should be the should be like the the watermark. Anything below that and you're disappointed it in in four and three, but you can at least stomach it. Under that, no, that is that's that's we failed miserably. See, Goff doesn't scare me with Detroit, but their O line and D line do, and I know that Dan Campbell's coming off for our kneecap. So um, I, I just know that I feel like Detroit already. I'm physically intimidated going into that matchup. You are. I am right. I'm I am also physically intimidated by Dan Campbell. He's a big dude. I wouldn't want to fight that guy. Whew. Anyway, all right. That's gonna wrap up this episode of Inside Black and Gold. We came a long way. He didn't say that much. Uh, but that's that's all right. We're we're getting back from the bye week. We're figuring it all out. This is it's one of those days. Um, but thanks everyone for listening. Again, this is Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He's Steve Geller. Thanks for coming along for the ride. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. Check us out on Twitter at Jeff underscore Nowak at Steve Geller WWL and the show at Saints underscore pod. Check out the latest news notes and analysis over at WWL.com. That column I referenced, you can go read it if you like that sort of thing and uh, hit me up and, and tell me about it. Um, tell me how much I'm wrong. That sort of thing. I thrive. I thrive on it. <laughs> tell me how I'm wrong. And and someone tell the Bobby that it should be the NFC South. Or is I'm like Bobby? Do you mean doubt? And what is what is doubt? No, I, I need you. I need you to, to reinforce this. The NFC South. <laughs> yeah, you got to say it like that. It's not soft. It's the NFC South. South. Kind of sounds like, yeah, right. Yeah, you got it. Okay, that's it. Who that? Go Saints. Beat the, beat the dirty birds, please. Let's go. Thanks. Peace, y'all. Peace.